Fredericksburg, Virginia, December 1862. Chancellorsville, May 1863, six months later, in the same historic state. Two victories of major importance for Robert E. Lee and his Confederate hosts in the war between the states. The military high noon of the Confederacy. Through them, the Southern Army reached its peak morale. The spirit of the twice-defeated Federal Army fell to its lowest. After Chancellorsville, Lee determined to carry the war into Northern Territory. He knew the discouragement in Federal ranks, the pessimism among civilians in the North where the movement for peace at any price was growing. A successful Northern campaign would break the backbone of resistance. Using the protecting screen of the Blue Ridge Mountains to conceal his northern thrust, Lee moved his full army over the war-famous Shenandoah Valley Pike through Front Royal and Winchester, Virginia, crossing the Potomac at Shepherdstown into Maryland on June 23rd. Meanwhile, Lee's stealthy departure was discovered, and the Federal Army started north on the eastern side of the mountains to defend Washington and Baltimore, crossing the Potomac at Edwards Ferry on June 25th. The Confederate advance had reached Carlisle and York, Pennsylvania on June 28th, uncomfortably close to the state capital at Harrisburg, when Lee discovered the Federals had followed him and had reached the region around Frederick, Maryland. Forced to withdraw and protect his line of retreat, the Shenandoah Valley, Lee concentrated his troops at Gettysburg. The next day, the Federals started pressing in northward from Frederick, the Confederates eastward from the mountains. The rising tides of blue and gray were increasing in size and power, and then they met at Gettysburg. On this battlefield, in three bloody days, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, Lee's dream was shattered. Gettysburg was the beginning of the end for the Confederacy. And 75 years later, in July 1938, these armies met again at Gettysburg. Their ranks reduced from hundreds of thousands to 8,000 aged veterans. And once more, this picturesque Pennsylvania town resounded to the tramp of marching feet and the roll of martial drums as the veterans encamped at nearby Gettysburg National Military Park. Paying honor to the old soldiers, almost every type of modern army equipment rolled through the streets of Gettysburg, offering stark contrast to the lumbering mortars and howitzers of 1863. Although in 1938 there were 8,000 veterans still living, only 1,818 were able to attend their last reunion. Union men outnumbering Confederates three to one. More than 160,000 soldiers fought at Gettysburg, but only 65 who actually took part in the offensive returned for the reunion. The average age of all the veterans in camp in 1938 was 94, but they had lots of fun in boasting of their health and strength. One of the most interesting camera subjects was Mr. William H. Jackson, a volunteer in Stannard's Vermont Brigade. Soon after the war, he became the pioneer photographer of the then unknown Far West and was first to record the wondrous beauties of Yellowstone Park. During various Civil War campaigns, Mr. Jackson made now invaluable sketches of important battles and historic areas. And how the words did fly, these aged but talkative vet-viving stories of tempestuous maneuvers and sallies, 
probably much in the style of the Union General Hancock's account of Lee's costly attack on Cemetery Ridge. The colors of the different regiments were now advanced, waving defiance of the long line of battle flags presented by the enemy. The men pressed firmly under them. After a few minutes of desperate fighting, the enemy's troops were repulsed. The battle flags were ours and the victory won. And everybody was all ears when they told of events associated with monuments and areas now in Gettysburg National Military Park. Northern or Southern, every veteran renewed the memory of his leader at Gettysburg, whether General Lee or General Meade, whose statues are near the position from which they directed their armies. These statues are but a mile apart across the fields lying between the Union and Confederate lines. And skyward monuments erected by various states to memorialize their soldiers who took part in the bloody struggle brought to mind troop movements such as Pickett's Charge or the attack by Law's Alabama Brigade. Actual spots where famous skirmishes and attacks took place were revisited. The slopes of Little Round Top in the distance, the massive boulders of Devil's Den, behind which Confederate sharpshooters harried and sniped at the Union troops stretched out on an opposite slope. Spangler Spring is vividly remembered because it was one of the few sources of water for the troops and its possession passed back and forth between the two armies. Once again, these soldiers of another day stood by an unforgettable stone wall, used as a Union breastworks in repulsing Confederate advances. Only a few Southerners crossed it. Nearby is the high water mark of the Confederacy, the point where the Southern lines began to fall back from their greatest advance to the eventual downfall of the Confederate states. Common feeling to veteran and visitor alike at the reunion was the sanctity of the National Cemetery, located on the wooded hill in the distance. Here is the Soldiers' National Monument, marking the spot from which President Lincoln delivered his Gettysburg Address of November 19, 1863. And thus was commemorated the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg and the final reunion of the Blue and Gray. Their deeds and thoughts are now forever placed in the realm of memory and history. But that the spirit of these valiant men might have some physical form, a memorial to them was placed in a conspicuous part of Gettysburg Park. A vast audience attended the dedication by President Roosevelt, and once again, all roads led to Gettysburg. Visitors came from the four corners of the nation. The Eternal Light Peace Memorial, surmounted by a bronze urn holding a perpetual flame, symbolizing the broad horizons and high destiny of the American people, cast in the mold of victories for union and independence. An enduring light to guide us in unity and fellowship. An enduring light dedicated to American peace an enduring light to the memory of heroic Americans, an enduring light, a symbol of enduring democracy that they met at Gettysburg was not in vain. If you enjoyed today's video and would like to see more content like this, be sure to take a shot at the like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell to stay up to date with all the latest bird dog content. And if you'd like to support the channel, for a limited time there's exclusive Civil War Diaries merchandise available in the video link below.